Hello everybody and welcome to the Alien vs Predator Galaxy podcast. This is regular host Aaron Percival, aka Corporal Hicks, and joining me is my usual partner in crime, Ridgetop, who also goes by Adam Zeller in the real world. Hey everyone. And joining us today is a special guest. If you've been reading the Expanded Universe recently, you will have probably picked up a series of the last few months, six months or so, I think. I'd like to welcome Gabriel Hardman to the show. Hey, Thanks for having me. Gabriel's okay, obviously the man behind Aliens, Aliens. Sorry, the comics are with a Z, uh, with an S. Um, yep. Dust to dust. Pretty much the <laughs> the main driving creative force behind it. Um, artist, uh, writer. You done the colors as well, haven't you? No, actually, uh, Rain Barreto uh, did the colors, and uh, Michael Heisler did the uh, letters. But <sighs> apart from that, yeah, I wrote and drew it. Fair enough. I think it, it's pretty rare for people who do the inks to also do the colors. Is that right? Not necessarily in the, in the uh, world of comics. It's certainly not unheard of. I mean, and more and more so now because uh, the workflow can be all digital. You know, somebody like Mitch Gerard's Gerard's uh, on uh, Gerard. I can I'm friends have been friends with this guy for a decade and I can't remember how to <laughs> pronounce the name. But he uh, does the that Mr. Miracle book at D.C. And, you know, I, I believe he he does everything because you know, he does everything digitally. So he can it can all be kind of done at the same time, uh, which I kind of, you know, uh, I, I kind of wish I could do it that way i i still draw traditionally on paper for the most part because i like it so i can't quite work that way though i have colored my own stuff as well did you do dust to dust the um, the old-fashioned way yeah i mean i drew it on paper absolutely yeah i mean i, I um sorry to for the questions to get completely derailed at the beginning <laughs> but i like the to especially with something like this you know where the texture and the atmosphere of this world is so important to it I prefer to be able to to use the kind of grungy real tools that I can use on paper rather than trying to recreate that feeling digitally. Also, I you know, I, I do other work that's exclusively digital for movies, and I like the ability to work on paper in comics because the workflow is a little different and the you know, I, I just have the ability to where I can't when I'm working on films. Yes, fair enough. I imagine the time scales are a lot shorter when it comes to um you know working on your concept art and storyboards and stuff. Yeah, it is. I mean it's with comics it's a it's at least a discrete thing. You're drawing a page. And there are that many pages in an issue and you have a certain amount of time to do it. In in movies, it's it's a kind of constant freak out of, you know, we need a million things tomorrow. Mm. But apart from that, it's really a lot about workflow because you need to be able to immediately send stuff to the director or whoever. And we may be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. In that <laughs> I haven't explained that I work on movies or anything like that. But yep. yeah, I mean, it, it is a little bit of a luxury in a way for me to be able to draw on paper in comic. Well, let's, uh, you know. Know, yeah, I think I bit. think that derailment was my fault. So sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, we might jump in with extra questions just here and there. Yeah, no, that's let's, all right. You know, let's clarify. <laughs> <laughs> so before we start nerding out about Alien, just wanted to you know thank you for taking the time to come and join us today. We always appreciate it when um, people who get to play in these franchises take the time to come and chat with a couple of nerds on the internet who have questions about it. Uh, but for our listeners who might not be aware of you outside of Dust to Dust, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? I've been working in comics, you know, mainly for the last like 10 years or so. I've drawn some stuff for, for Marvel and I and early on and then did uh, runs on other licensed books where that I co-wrote with my wife, Karina Becco. Uh, we did a Planet of the Apes run. We did a Star Wars run. We And we more, most recently did a graphic novel for DC called Green Lantern Earth One. It was pretty well received last year, but also create our own work at Image, mainly our science fiction series, Invisible Republic, uh, that w is on hiatus, but we'll be coming back to pretty soon. Along the lines of more horror oriented stuff like Dust to Dust, I have a one shot called The Belfry from Image. And uh, Karina and I also have another graphic novel called Heathen Town, uh, horror, something that I love as well as science fiction. So bringing those two things together for Alien is, is a, a sweet spot for me. But the otherwise, I have a, a career as a, uh, an illustrator and a storyboard artist for movies like Inception and Interstellar and uh, Logan and loads of other stuff. I've been doing that for many years. Uh, and that's kind of my day job. No opportunities to work on Prometheus or Covenant? I don't believe that ever came up. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's more about who you know uh -huh. and how things work out in that way because the like i had had it came up to work on a, a ridley scott movie a couple of years before 
for that and I was unable to do it. And that's, you know, it's just down to who's working on it with who and, you know, the whether you get a call for something like that or not. But I also limit my storyboard work to a degree. Like I, I try to take fewer films now because I spend a good portion of my time on comics. That's fair enough. And something we love to do on the show is to ask our guests, especially guests who've got to play in this sandbox themselves about the first time they ever came across the series. Do you recall your first experience of Alien? Oh, I definitely do. My very first even recognition that Alien existed was, you know, in 1979, I was like five years old. And I remember a and I lived in Northern California, just north of San Francisco. Lots of hippie type people moved up there, you know, in the 70s and, you know, after San Francisco, uh, after all of that, you know, 60s San Francisco stuff. And I remember our neighbor this woman across the street going to see aliens and uh, coming back and my mom asking her how alien was. And she said it was far out. And I, for some reason, like this is lodged in my memory forever. And, uh, but, but the first time I actually, my first real experience with it though, was what was the Cameron movie seeing aliens in the theater when I was 12 years old and it being hugely impactful to me. It was the most like intense movie going experience I'd ever had. It's probably the most intense experience I'd ever had at 12 coming out of that movie and being that age was something that really stuck with me and i definitely wanted to bring that kind of intensity to the to this comic as well i saw aliens at a <laughs> very young age as well i was it was the day before my fifth birthday yeah <laughs> the intensity of that film was the thing that made me so or would make me so obsessed with this when I was able to deal with it, you know, it gave me nightmares yeah. for five years. Sure. <laughs> so I could completely understand that. I think I saw it at a time where it was less about, you know, something that would give me nightmares and more about like, you know, being very excited, not only about, you know, just the experience of watching the movie, but I was by then interested in filmmaking, you know, interested in the fact that, you know, uh, how did this work? Why was this so intense? You know, mm -hmm. and which would be something that I would be think about more and more, you know, with a lot of different stuff, both in comics and movies and visual storytelling in general, you know, as I started to get older. Yeah, completely understand. This is my new staple question when we get to chat to people who work on the, the Alien series, um, especially creatives such as, such as yourself. It's mostly because it's such a topic of um, fun debate on our forums, and it, and it is about the skull in H.R. Giger's original Alien design. Oh, yeah. Right, so, right. You know, it's, it's not prominent in the film. You wouldn't I say prominent, it's not visible really at all in the film. But, you know, you, you get a lot of it in the behind the scenes stuff. Mm -hmm. So the the raging debate is pro school or anti school. As a creative yourself and as somebody who's got to, to dabble in aliens, um, where do you stand on the matter? I think I'm going to come down on the anti skull side ultimately, but I do, I actually do like all of those elements of, that the Giger elements that are really like the kind of anthropomorphized things that he put in there. I, I like them, but I think that as a design, ultimately for the film, it's more effective. That blankness is more effective than having any kind of, you know, any sense of eyes, any sense of something that, you know, makes it more human-like, you know? So I really think that the eyeless blankness you know of the uh xenomorph is the key thing about making it like one of the most classic creature designs i am never gonna win this fight <laughs> <laughs> oh, the wow. skull is neat though but neat isn't the same thing as effective uh storytelling for, for me i just find the the prospect of the empty skull the empty eye sockets a bit more terrifying but it just seems to be me yeah, I, I think everybody else is scared of the scarier one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. Well. <laughs> oh, well. Let's see how it's going to be. This is how this is going to go. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so uh, Aliens Dust to Dust is, is one of the latest in a long, long history of Alien comic series. How familiar were you with the expanded universe prior to working on Dust to Dust? I mean, I assume you have some familiarity with it through your wife because uh, she worked on oh yeah the crossover uh, yeah the alien vampirella book yeah and i also you know i've read the aliens books certainly on and off for the entire time that 
Dark Horse has been putting them out. You know, and there've been loads of great stories, you know, as far as like art wise, the book that Mike Mignola drew, the Alien Salvation book from uh-huh. years ago. And well, I think Kevin Nolan even inked that. And uh, anytime Kevin Nolan has been near Aliens is a treat because he's, you know, uh, like a great craftsman, but also can bring a kind of sleek sort of atmosphere to it that is very different from something I would do. But, uh, you know, uh, that, that kind of elegant, inky sort of quality of his uh, I, I think really sells that stuff. But yeah, I mean, I've, I'm certainly familiar enough, although my allegiance is really to the first two movies. I, I, that's where, you know, my North Star is. Well, I have two North Stars. <laughs> it's first Ridley Scott movie and, uh, and Cameron's Aliens, because I just think those are like perfectly crafted movies. On the topic of um, of your wife, of Corona, did she, you know, sort of offer you any advice going into Dust to Dust, you know, with her having prior experience with the Aliens Vampirella thing? Did you lean on her no, at all? I don't, not exactly. I mean, we had, you know, we talked a lot about Aliens Vampirella because, I mean, we were writing other stuff together at the time and, you know, and still are. We've spent enormous amounts of time talking about, about Aliens. <laughs> so, like, you know, just in many circumstances and watched the movies over and over again and for both of us we're we're both huge fans of that so it's it's hard to even distinguish exactly what we talked about for that particular thing versus just in general okay so in a previous interview with the perfect organism podcast you explained that a tweet got you the gig working on dust to dust Uh, we weren't too sure if you were joking or not did randy stradley's offer really come from that uh yeah yeah. <laughs> the, um, oh. I uh, I knew Randy, though. I mean, we did the Star Wars book for him. It was like the last Star Wars book that Dark Horse did. So we'd worked with him for quite a while. And uh, and Randy has this way of being incredibly casual about offering stuff and approaching things. And I mean, the way that we got the Star Wars book seemingly was somebody, I believe the letter, Michael Heisler, who also lettered uh, Dust to Dust, had read our Planet of the Apes book and recommended it to Randy. But I'm pretty sure that Randy just saw us at Emerald City Comic Con at our table, walked up to us and said, hey, do you want to do a Star Wars book? <laughs> you know, and uh, and we were like, yeah, OK. And then it just <laughs> happened, you know. The, this was similar in that I had wanted to work with Randy again. And like after, I mean, I think I did some kind of not entirely serious tweet about the different franchise things that I'd worked on and that Alien was the one thing that I really would have, you know, that I would really still love to do. And I don't know, somebody just showed it to Randy and by the next morning he had emailed me and he's like, okay, so you want to do an Alien book? (laughs) Like, it was really that simple. (laughs) That's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. I I wish we could do that. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that would would make things nice. I wanted to ask you about the early days of working on the series. Uh, How did those first conversations go did randy come to you with a story or was it more up to you no no the only thing that he said was that they really didn't want to do something that focused on colonial marine you know they they wanted something different and that was very much up my alley you know like i i I definitely wanted to do a story that was a little more uh ground level and with characters who were you know not not so qualified to go up against aliens i mean i was totally on board for that i just wrote up like three different pitches and sent them in and he was like yeah we're gonna go we will we'll we'll just go with this one pick the dust to dust one and that was it you know it's it's actually really straightforward (laughs) it was really simple what were the other two well i can't tell you that Uh... (laughs) what if i what if i did one of them you know in the in the future Fair enough. Can't fault me for trying. One of the first things I noticed personally reading it was just the size of the colony seemed a lot larger than we had seen before. Like this was an actual city with yeah people had cars and we had only really seen like these these smaller colonies before. So it was kind of cooler to see a infestation, I guess, of that scale going on and just the chaos surrounding that. Well, and I wanted it to feel like these people could have had a more normal life before this, you know, like that you could picture, even though I'm not, I'm clearly, if you read the book, I'm clearly not a fan of enormous amounts of exposition, but I like to infuse things with stuff where you can say, oh, well, if it's like this, presumably there was a, you know, there was a bit more of a thriving world here before, before all this happened and infer stuff. I mean, I, you know, I chose a really you know, a sort of strict way to go with this because it was obviously a little bit of an experiment because 
I wanted to really tell this from the point of view of this kid. And the kid is not privy to everything that's going on in the world the way Mm -hmm. as a kid, you're not, you know, you don't have, you know, you don't have access to all the information and you don't have, you know, and you don't really have the power to do anything about it. So, I mean, I, I really wanted to, and to stay true to that perspective, because I felt like being that kid and having your whole world collapse around you is enormously traumatizing. And, you know, and I, I wanted to just be able to show the story through that lens. It was one of the things I quite liked about it, actually, was not really, it wasn't necessary as well to know exactly what yeah. what was happening, what all the backstory was. Uh, I mean, we, we ended up getting some, some explanation yeah. for the situation in the fourth issue anyway, but I don't think the series would have been any less if you hadn't have done that. I think it would have still worked. I mean, I feel like I owed a little bit. You know, I I feel like uh, often when I'm just writing and drawing things myself, I tend to like push my, particularly when I'm, it's just me writing and drawing, I tend to push towards extremes in things. So, and to make kind of complicated, challenging situations for myself, because like if you're writing something for another artist to draw or, you know, you're drawing something that someone else has written, you don't have that immediate ability to control things down to the subtlest level. And, you know, when I'm in the position where I can do that, I want to push things and do it in a way where the audience has to meet me a little bit halfway. And and I, I challenge the reader to go along with me a little bit instead of spoon feeding everything. So, you know, I mean, and it's it's walking on a wire doing that. So, I mean, if, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but I, I think that it's worth trying trying to creatively take take that challenge and and hitting the ground running as well the the series yeah. really did again you know if you're in that sort of situation you're not going to know everything so it all it yeah. all worked as far as i'm concerned with that so you 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 mentioned uh, your younger protagonist uh, max um you spoke previously in the past about wanting you know, wanting a younger child, wanting somebody who lacked power. Mm-hmm. Something about the series that I noticed was that the adults who were sort of guarding him, being his guardians, whatever, looking after him, sort of changed between issues. Yeah, that that was a case of being slaughtered in some some circumstances. But sure, I, I was I was wondering if that, that's going to happen now. Yeah, <laughs> was was that a reflection of his powerlessness in that situation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fact that he didn't have any that that there wasn't a central sort of, you know, I I wanted to give the feeling like, oh, you know, he'll be able to rely on, you know, this one person and then like undermine that immediately afterwards so that there so that there's never a sense that uh, that there's something solid for him to stand on, that he has some somebody to turn to that uh and also just that uh, i think that it's maybe a little disingenuous in some things where uh where they portray the adults as being these kind of so caring and thoughtful about you know some stranger kids or something like that that they get thrown in with in some disaster situation you know i i have maybe a slightly more cynical take on that and <laughs> and you know and felt like you know, what if this random group of people you can't necessarily rely on? Maybe you can't. Maybe they're not people who, you know, who are only looking out for uh, the greater good. But, you know, they're they're people who have much more base sort of uh, instincts. I mean, not all of them. And there's and hopefully there's uh, some gray area and subtlety with these characters. But like I wanted the kid to not have something solid to hang on to. And add into I mean, I don't I don't think it was really a factor um, with dust to dust, but then you can also add in that sort of resentment of it actually being him and his mother's fault that they. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Were, no. Were I think, no. I think it did. Fa- no, it did factor in though. I mean, that that was part of what drove them in, you know, uh, their suspicions of, or you know, or their bad feelings you know, to a degree towards the kid, because uh, if the kid and the mother hadn't gotten on the ship, uh, this wouldn't have happened to them. But I guess the, the larger ship that they were trying to get to was already infected anyway. But from the, like you could, you know, you could still hold on to that kind of thing though. You know, I mean, maybe they would have made it into orbit and like another ship would have picked them up and it it would have been fine and never gotten, you know, well, you know, the, the messiness of a circumstance like this was something that I really like to explore. The big thing with Dust to Dust, I think, in terms of law, is what you did with the alien inheriting traits from it. So um, the the main alien in this birth from Max's mom, and is is shown to pretty much protect him. I guess she's <laughs> she's his adult. A little figure. bit, maybe. You know, spoilers uh, for anybody who's uh, no, I'll, I'll add that on the post. There are spoilers. Yeah. Are going to be spoilers in this interview. So. 
I thought you'd actually left it pretty uncertain until the yeah. closing pages of the fourth issue, and I, I think it, it pretty much became a little bit of a certainty at that point. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's still ambiguous. There are two conflicting ideas that you're left with, whether or not it's, you know, the, there is something driving this that, uh, I mean, because it's it's very subjective, you know, everything that, you know, there's there's nothing empirical saying this is what's going on here. It's entirely from the point of view of the characters. The characters are guessing why this creature is behaving the way that it is. I mean, obviously, the reader is the one who makes the decision. Uh, I'm just presenting this. So if it feels definitive, fine. But it also is in the last, you know, in the last chapter of it, there there are two conflicting ideas that can't completely be reconciled. And I like that. Uh, fair enough. I, I took it from when mum jumped the queen yeah. was when I thought it, it became a bit explicit. No, but if, yeah, I get it. But um, I, I just wanted to ask you about the concept. Was was this something from your own pitch or was this something that came down from Fox? No, it was just in the story. You know, I mean, it was a way to also a way to kill off the mother, but still have the question of, you know, uh, still have her be an element of the story that's important. And the fact is, I'm not, you know, even if, you know, like you say, it's, uh, it, it seems to be that she's defending him at the end. It, it still is all very ambiguous. And it's not, it's not me saying this is the way things work in aliens. As far as I'm concerned, I'm telling a story, stories from the point of view of these characters and these characters don't have all the information. So there's no omniscient answer here okay yeah personally i thought it was just a really interesting element one of the things i was like thinking while reading it was like well what would happen if she actually got to him like would she just be saving him to be implanted himself in like some yeah. sort of quote-unquote reincarnation that she, that he interpreted she had or something like that or or if it was something else. So it, it was kind of an interesting question for me. And also, it's how much does it even mean? You know, I mean, is it uh, is it some vague instinct that the xenomorph couldn't even understand? Is it, you know, it's just it's just stuff to think about. Where did that come from for you then? What what made you want to play with this particular angle, um, even if you, you did want to leave it ambiguous at the end of it? It's a lingering thing you know i mean the you know the the idea of at least you know an easy jump off from the the idea that they are you know they they take on some trait of you know mm-hmm. the, the person that they incubated inside of like i say i didn't i didn't want to make it something really explicit and i don't want and i don't i'm not not out to you know create new lore or undermine things or whatever this is a very human level story taking place way off in a corner someplace and you know that is about these people and this situation and so that's and the way that they look at things you know how the the bigger world of aliens and all of this lore and everything looks to them it was was interesting to me because it reminded me of a um, sort of old fan theory in regards to the first film so you know like the whole thing about what did the alien do to Lambert Mm -hmm. one one of the theories was that if it did rape her it was um, like a inherited attraction that Kane might have had for her. I mean, mm. it's, it's not supported in the film at all, but, you know, that, right. <laughs> that, that kind of thing's been in the, the zeitgeist for a while. So I was like, oh, I, I didn't actually expect anybody to to play with this. So it was um, it, it was interesting when you were Yeah, it's it. just one of those kind of things that has, you know, you've always sort of heard about. You've always sort of thought, you know, maybe, you know. And I, but like I say, I didn't want, it wasn't my intention to say this is how it works. You know, uh-huh. yeah, and I, I don't think it came across that way at all. I mean, it is it is an interesting concept that has been brought up before. Like even in Alien Resurrection, they talk about like genetic memories and stuff like that. But I wanted to see those designer pig aliens. Those sounded pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if only next time. You know. <laughs> so that that's one of the that's one of the things that we don't really get to see a lot of that I really really would like and that is you know like multiple uh, variants um a dog alien and a, a normal sure. alien whatever um, yeah yeah but next time yeah next time. yeah yeah it's, the next one's all about the pig alien you know, <laughs> it's, it's just them on their own their troubles their their worries you know we get real deep inside the pig aliens oh, good. some some introspective stuff you know thought, oh absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. 
sounds like a win. Alien Pig 2, because yeah. we had Alien Pig 1, although I don't think they got that far with that one. It's been a while <laughs> since I've read it. I just remember the cover art of the little pig um, trundling in front of the alien, and it literally was called Alien Pig, if I remember rightly. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember that. Uh, I'll, so. have to, I'll have to check and leave in the editor's notes for this episode. One of the older comics. Oh, yeah, it was a, it was a one-shot, if I... If I'm mm. thinking the right one. Anyway, sorry. Um, so you you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I was, you know, in terms of the visuals, how do you go about setting up your panels? You know, I know some artists use physical standings of people, and um, I think one particular artist used to use um a figure to sort of help lay them out. Um, I will use uh, you know, photos of a, a, an actor or something like that as a just kind of general jumping off point for a character. But I never try to get likenesses or anything like that. I, you know, I, I want the stuff to be, um, I mean, it, things can get really stiff if you're tracing photos and, uh, and that's just not really my thing. You know, really it's about the story. It's about telling the story. It's about like what, visually what the story demands and you know the visual storytelling has always been kind of my thing and uh you know i mean it falls through from you know working on films doing storyboards i mean i just approach it as i don't really you know i do a lot of research and i do and i like try to ground things in some level of research and some level of just kind of credible visual stuff uh, especially in a science fiction book, but I don't, uh, I don't like use specific models for people or, or set up poses or anything like that. So what do you think has been the most satisfying part of your time on dust to dust? Um, it's just been able to being able to like, I mean, I've done other things, create our own type things where I've written and drawn everything myself, but this is the first time that I've done that. I did a freelance book that I both wrote and drew all on my own. So, uh, like, uh, just basically being in charge of, uh, of of the whole thing, you know, doing and, uh, you know, just following that path. Although, you know, there was little or no, I, I didn't really get a lot of um, negative feedback or be, I wasn't told that I, there were things I couldn't do. So, I mean, it was in that way, it was a very smooth process. And I, I was able to tell the story that I wanted to tell uh, with the support of Randy. And so, it, doing this book was not radically different from me doing book that I own that where there's no one to tell me what, what to do. You know, I mean, I've been very lucky in working on uh, several like licensed properties where I was, you know, I mean, there's a in, in general, people think that there's a giant, you know, that there are all these uh, rules and things you can and can't do on licensed books. But I've been able to work on several properties like that, where I've just been able to tell the story that I wanted to tell. And, uh, you know, this was no exception. This was a really uh, freeing experience in that way. And, you know, I and I think that it's, you know, it's good for things like this to just go out on a limb and uh, let people tell a story that they're interested in because you're going to get something more passionate out of that. So you would say Fox and Dark Horse allowed pretty much creative freedom for you for the comic yeah. then? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that said, I'm very responsible about this stuff, you know? I mean, like, in, in all of the things that I've worked on, I'm not out to break it. I'm not out to, like, do something that is going to go wildly against the, you know, the the basic form of the kind of stories that are already told in it. I want to do something that is doing something new, but is is you, saying in this world, what's what's a, a compelling story that I can tell? Right, leave it to Ridley Scott to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. I mean, I mean to to go against what what came before. Oh, sorry sure, that sure. that was my my covenant jab for for the episode. <laughs> you know, we we haven't actually asked you about your um, your thoughts on the prequel um, prequel films. I'm not a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Ridley Scott. You know, I mean, and I have nothing but admiration for Ridley Scott. But I think that the it's the explaining is detrimental to me. You know, it's it's detrimental to the universe of, of aliens to uh, to spend the time undermining what makes them scary and what makes them, you know, uh, interesting to me. Right. So you're a proponent of the, uh, you know, the unknowable kind of yes, um, side. Absolutely. Of I am. It's fair enough. Uh, you're certainly not alone in that. <laughs> 
between Dust to Dust and Aliens Dead Orbit, we've we've actually had two series in a row where the writer and the artist are the same individual. A bit more creative coherency, I guess, um, comes as a result of that. Do you think there's an appetite from Dark Horse and from readers for seeing more series like that? Well, I think there seems to be, but you know, I don't know that I'm the person to ask. You know, I mean, like Randy Stradley, this, you know, <laughs> like it, I, I think that I was very happy to be able to, you know, do the book, and I think that it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I would love to see more books like this from other uh, creators, though. I mean, I'd love to see people that you wouldn't necessarily think of doing, uh, you know, writing and drawing aliens books, because I think it's a great, you know, it's, it's just got such a built in visceral quality to it. Using that as a jumping off point can go so many places while still being intrinsically alien, you know, so I, 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 you know, I would, I would love to see more writer writers do these kind of books. Do you have any interest in coming back for another series? Oh yeah, I would like to do that. If I mean, if I can, I mean, if if it works out timing wise, and you know, and works out for them, you know, I would love to do that. And we've talked a little bit about it. You know, we've talked a little bit about it. You just have to drop Randy a tweet when you're ready. Yeah, I... <laughs> so that's actually everything from us. Uh, we did just have a community question by Devin Gill uh, via the Facebook group, and who would like to know. If you would ever do a sequel with an older Max who was profoundly changed by his experiences in Dust to Dust. Uh, yes, <laughs> I would do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's something I've, I've, I've definitely thought about. And I think that it um, it would be a, you know, a, an adult Max and, uh, you know, would have an, a completely different perspective on all this sort of stuff. And, you know, and certainly would have been uh you know changed and traumatized by this experience and uh and uh yeah i I would definitely be interested in doing that okay there's there's another one randy if you're listening (laughs) thank you you know once again for joining us before we do sign off uh, is there anything you'd like to share any anecdote from your time on the comic or or a thought or whatever that we just haven't given you the opportunity to put across uh geez i'm sure i um uh, I'm sure there's something, but here's the thing. I'm working on it all by myself, right? <laughs> like, you know, there, there's not quite as much room for uh, fun anecdotes and stuff when it's just you sitting in your uh, studio writing a script and then drawing it, you know? But I, but I do, I, I did love working on the book and uh, I would uh, I would love to do more. And I, I love the ability to finally be able to, to do something with, you know, like what I think is like the greatest creature design ever you know i mean uh, i think guillermo del toro said that it was the second best after uh um the uh, creature from the black lagoon but i'm i'm afraid he's incorrect <laughs> and i believe it's coming out in may on the 7th the paperback for the series yeah okay i'll go with that um <laughs> the, uh got some conflicting information but it's fine i'm sure may, you'll be able to get it in may that'll be great and i uh uh, I'm, I'll be very happy to, you know, to have it all together in a, you know, in a nice package. I mean, the the single issues are cool, but to me, I really like things to be a book and a complete story. So uh, the the trade is the thing that I that I really work towards. Yeah, I've uh, I've always more kind of one my early days of reading Aliens comics. I would always like see the graphic novels and buy the graphic novels before I mm. would get to the the single issues later. That's because we missed the golden age. We're, we're a little bit younger, so we, we yeah. missed all the singles from the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> T- I totally get you. Um, personally, because I miss that experience so much, I, I will get the singles and then I'll upgrade to the trade when it's um, when it's available and then give my singles away. They both have big, you know, upsides. I mean, the clearly the, uh, the singles are designed for the cliffhanger and everything and uh which i think is very important and great and should be in there whether it's collected or not but i i do really love having something that is a book that can go on a shelf yeah yeah do you do you know if there's any sort of behind the scenes material in there or anything have you have you yeah there is there is we've put it together already it's uh there uh, i have some some little conceptual art type stuff that i did and uh um, and I uh, wrote an essay for it, and uh, you know, there's uh, there's there's some some good back matter in there as well. Cool. That's another great thing about the trades. I love it when they come with stuff like that. Yeah. That's everything then. Great. Before we give our socials out, um, is there any sort of places you'd like to direct people to if they want to learn more about you or interact with you or whatever? 
Yeah, uh, you can uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm just Gabriel Hardman on Twitter, uh, where you mostly see me uh, lately tweeting uh, uh, photos from the Making of the Planet of the Apes book that I've been reading. Um, <laughs> and and then um, on, I'm on Instagram as Gabriel Hardman Art. Almost none of these places I actually put up much of my own art anymore, but but uh, you could certainly see what the stuff that I'm working on. And I can't, I have nothing to announce, really. I, I'm working on a, a book that I, I'm not allowed to talk about yet. And so, and that's, it's a graphic novel, so it's a little ways off. So uh, um, so I'm in, kind of in between stuff. But the silence doesn't mean you're not doing anything. It's coming. Yeah, I'm always doing too much, you know? <laughs> I mean, there, there, I'm... There's always too much going on yeah. uh, between trying to schedule having a career working in movies and also getting comics out. Uh, sometimes those things uh, don't agree with each other. <laughs> and uh, there, and the, there's always too much going on. But I'm, uh, you know, I'm trying to get it all done. Yeah, I know that feeling. Probably not to the extent that uh, you probably <laughs> suffer from. But no, I understand that completely. In terms of, in terms of us then, uh, if you're listening to this and you're not aware of the the community um we do have a website avpgalaxy.net where you'll find pretty much all the latest news uh, reviews interviews discussion podcasts all that kind of stuff we're on the socials on twitter as uh, avp galaxy on facebook and instagram as alien versus predator galaxy versus as in vs dot um, we're on youtube as well that's still yeah, still um, a baby sort of project, but we're doing okay with that. We've got Let's Plays of um, AVP 2010 and AVP Requiem for the PSP. And I think that's everything. So thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been Corporal Hicks. Ian Ridgetop. And this is Gabriel Hardman signing off.